structure and flexibility. The RP Diet app builds a structure of eating that creates the results you're looking for, but has the flexibility to let you scan your favorite foods and follow your preferred diet philosophy. The digital diet coach in your pocket is more powerful than ever, so let's build a better you with the RP Diet app. And folks, welcome back. RP Plus weekly webinar, Dr. James and Dr. Mike here, answering a whole bunch of questions this week. Mike, how are we doing? We are doing good, good, good. All Let's right. get into it, yeah? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Okay. So, it automatically full screen. All right. So, Jesse Irwin starts us off. Hello, doctors. Huge fan of your work. I'm a doctor currently working in psychiatry. Ooh, crazy people. There was a psychiatry <laughs> episode of... Uh, uh, that it didn't air last night. We're watching reruns, but it's a uh, uh, sex murder show. What's that called, James? SVU. <laughs> sex murder show. Yes. <laughs> um, so we, Chris and I, like literally, like, come home. We're like sex murder, and she's like, "Yep." Yeah. We'll start watching it. But anyway, it was just a kind of trip. Okay, I was undertaking powerlifting uh, training for the first two point five years of my lifting career. I got a two thirty squat, one forty five bench, two twenty five deadlift, at one hundred body weight. Nothing impressive. And after two point five years of lifting, I'd say that's really impressive. Yeah, that's not not shabby at all. I'm looking to switch things up to bodybuilding very seriously over the next two years or so. And my job in psychiatry has a tendency to be eight to five Monday through Friday. Because of this, I'm looking to embark on twice daily training. Okay. I don't know how that supports twice daily training. But we'll get into that. My current plan is to periodize frequency across uh, the next three mesocycles before resensitizing thereafter. I wish to train quads, hams, back, pecs, 2x first meso, 3x second meso. I like that it corrects it to meal. Um, <laughs> Good spot. I didn't even see that. 4X, third meso, biceps, shoulders, traps, and forearms similarly will increase from 4 to 5 to 6. If this full body volume increases effectively exponentially throughout the meso cycles, I hope to train six times per week. Um, meso 1, nine times meso 2, and 12 times meso 3. I have a few questions that I find difficult to articulate without examples, so I've provided examples of the questions below. If they are too convoluted to make any sense, my apologies, or I apologize. Thanks, heaps. Must be Australian. Heaps. Yeah. So, wow, man, that really is fucking loud. That's crazy. I got a directional microphone that doesn't have to have a direction. Amazing. Yeah, maybe next time I'm, I'm over, I'll help you look at it. Sometimes you have to just pick the right setting and whatnot. Oh, it has settings, huh? Most of them do, but we'll figure it out. Okay. All right. So um, I am currently on week one. Okay. Question one. I'm currently on week one of week three of Meso One, and I started implementing this. What are your thoughts on starting with a minimum number of sessions for a block and auto-regulating additional sessions based on total set number per session? I started this Meso with six sessions, mm -hmm. and once a session reached a certain threshold, I would split the session. If it were greater than 20 sets per session for upper body and 12 sets per session for lower body, I split that session at AM PM for the following weeks. So this amount cycle, my number of training sessions has gone six, six, eight, and will be eight again in week four. Next meso, I'll start at eight and progress this auto-regulatory model and so forth. Any advice on why or why not this is a good thing to do? I mean, I think it's fine on paper. It might get very difficult tracking, and it might really fuck with your schedule. Uh, but if you can pull it off, I think it's okay. What do you think, James? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that one, Mike, because I, th I think like just from an auto regula re blah, auto regulation standpoint, that's fine. But in terms of like habit formation, keeping a good schedule, and being able to track your progress on your lifts, like basically anything that you had done in the first session. Uh, and that you now move to a second session becomes very difficult to determine if you're matching reps per the same RIR and things like that, because it's just a completely different condition. So I think from an auto regulation standpoint, it's fine. I would say that like what, what is probably more important is your ability to maintain consistency across like your lifting conditions. And that just adds like a really big element of variability. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of that, but I don't see any like major flaws, any big problems outside of that. Yeah. Yeah. Question two. I'm attempting to follow the RP set progression algorithm each week. The first mass cycle looks like I'll be doing 12 sets of back work on both of my pull days in the final week of meso six. Six verticals, six horizontals, six sets. 
in five to 10 and six sets in 10 to 20. My back seems to have a large MRV. Many people's backs. Yeah, do. that's normal. Maybe because I only minimally trained it while doing powerlifting, SBD, maybe. So it's not that strong. Powerlifting, gotcha. silent but deadly. Yeah. Uh, in, subs- <laughs> in subsequent mesocycles, would the aim be to match or exceed that set number on those corresponding days? Absolutely not. Set progression should be completely auto regular. Yes. So, like below the number of sets listed represents the sets last week. Uh, back training the meso, meso one, 12 sets, 12 sets, meso two, 12 to 13, 12 to 15, additional day, meso three, 12 to 14, 12 to 14, match previous corresponding day, add additional day. Is the above what I should be aiming for, or is the aim of the progress the total number of sets per week, even if the corresponding session decreases something like below? Meso one, 12 sets, 12 sets, total 24, meso two, 10 sets, 10 sets, 6, total 26. Meso three, eight sets, eight sets, six sets, six sets, so 28. So what will end up happening is much more like your second example than your first. Because as you increase the frequency, remember the amount of time you're going to get to recover for the next session is going to decline. So you will not find that you can uh, upregulate. But the set progression algorithm will straight up just determine that for you. Um, So you really don't want to progressively, just had another podcast where I talked about this in depth. You don't want as a rule to add sets, you only add sets according to the set progression algorithm. It either tells you to add sets or it tells you not to add sets. And then you reach a point where it says, Hey, look, don't add any more sets. Um, You know, your performance is sort of like, you know, barely hanging in and you're just, or you're not, soreness isn't recovering on time. Then you do not add sets. So just don't do it. And that could happen at six sets or five sets per training session. Who knows? Right. And then he says, um, for the second example, he says, I feel like this would violate progressive overload as the heavier first and second day's volume decreases throughout the mouse cycle, even though the total back set number would increase. It does not violate progressive overload at all. No, not at all. Uh, progressive overload is uh, just uh, some of all stressors is the best way to look at it. Um, not every single part of your program has to get harder. Yeah, I mean, um, like, I think what's important when, and sometimes maybe we don't articulate this as well as maybe as we should, but the idea of a progressive overload comes from things like the volume, intensity, and frequency, all of which are accumulating and combining to hit some kind of threshold of, in this case, stimulating muscle growth. It doesn't just, I mean, it comes maybe a lopsided distribution of those things, but it's a combination of all of those things that contribute to it. So you don't have to see like a purely linear increase in one of those variables in order to satisfy a progressive overall. Yeah, 100%. Um, And then he says, uh, final thought, should I live in my first mouse cycle in the future? So I uh, cap each back session at eight sets in order to allow for progressive overload on a particular day. No. I feel like training 12 sets might be too much for one session. Depends on what the auto regulation says. It might not be. Um, if they're very stimulating, then they will cause lots of fatigue and you won't be able to progress. So, yes, that's the case. Just make sure you start nice and low at close to your MEV and then let the auto regulation take over. Uh, and then he says, however, I feel my performance doesn't drop off outside of the desired rep range. Well, maintains good form for those lost on set. So remember, perform, we don't measure performance um, drop off um, within rep ranges. We don't really care about that. Performance drop is determined by week to week to week. If week to week to week, you're doing a certain number of sets and your performance is not declining and you're not like violently sore, you're probably getting great hypertrophy. So I would not worry about that. Um, yeah, I agree. And I think it's, it's, I mean, it's good to have like kind of a tentative framework for how some of these things are going to pan out, especially if you have experience running similar mesocycles or similar blocks. So it's, it's good to have like an idea of how this is going to look. But ultimately, a lot of this does come down to auto regulation. So I mean, like you can plan until you're, you know, blue in the face, but ultimately, like you're going to have to be responding to what is actually happening in training. And that's something that we tried to talk about in in developing an annual plan for sports. It's like, it's a good idea to have a framework for what you're going to be doing for this year, but who the fuck knows what's actually going to end up happening until you're in that moment, right? So it's good to like, again, have a a structure, but then ultimately auto regulations, what's going to take over and making a lot of these decisions. So uh, like spending hours and hours and hours trying to map this out explicitly is probably just a waste of your time because you're going to be using the set progression algorithm to figure it out anyway. Yeah, 100%. Sorry, let me try to do a better job with the microphone here. I like this microphone was doing a floppy dick thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one just falls over. I keep trying to f- like find a position for mine that's not in the camera view, but then I just can't get it to like set properly because it flops over or it's like in the way. So I just, I try to put it in the corner so it's not too obstructive, but still getting good position. Can you hear me louder now or no? 
Uh, about the same. Uh, what about now? About the same. Okay. Anyway. Sounds, sounds good, though. Sounds fine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, recommendation. Okay, well, question three. If the recommendation would be that 12 to 14 sets in the final week of the mouse cycle is fine, it is. What are your thoughts on breaking up a single body part across the day? So on those larger back sessions, doing six to seven sets of one back exercise in the morning, six to seven of the other back exercises at the PM, this would effectively mean I'm training back six times per week, four days per week, or, or would it be best to keep that session together and do accessory bicep shoulders and traps in the PM as their own session? Um, thank you so much. Uh, if this made any sense, I'll be very happy. It made lots of sense. Um, uh, splitting up training any more than four or five times per week is probably just going to do very little to no good. And it might aggravate some injuries and stuff like that. So, yeah. And specifically the question is kind of, is like, why, why are you doing that? Is there like, what are you seeking to gain that you would not gain just doing all of the back stuff in that one session and then maybe moving some of your accessory work to a later session? You know what I mean? So it's like, what do you, what do you think's going to happen? That's not already happening right then and there. I guess you could have a higher performance on the back movements, but performance doesn't always correlate with hypertrophy because you want to sequester metabolites. You want acute fatigue to go up during the session. In this way, you're sort of just doing more sub-maximal sessions than maximal sessions. Yeah, I think if you were in like a strength or power sport, like weightlifting, that might be a good option uh, because yeah. the intensity is more important. But in bodybuilding kind of stuff, man, I think you're just needlessly, I think you're, you're seeking out frequency for its own sake rather than using frequency to solve problems that you're encountering, you know, if that makes sense. So yeah. that's probably not the best mindset. So like if there's a problem that you're encountering that altering the frequency can help with, then by all means, go for it. But if it's like, if you can just do your normal back workout in one, one session, like, why not just do that? It just seems yeah. needlessly difficult. For sure. Alex Vizzi. Vizzo. Boy, Vizzo. Said, hi, this is related to Sean's post from last week about straight sets. Oh, no. How do that post? I'm a new personal trainer and I work at a barbell dumbbell only gym that has a prescribed workout and promises results. I just started reading up on hypertrophy via RP and juggernaut uh, books, uh, as well as trying RP templates on myself. Since I started to work there, I want uh, to adapt the programming to comply with what I understand the science to say. Basically, we do straight low rep sets and increase intensity over a metal cycle. I'm pretty shy, so arguing about the veracity of the program is harder for me than just tweaking it to maximize positive results. I want to... Uh, sneak volume increases by cutting into rests, doing two minutes instead of three, and maybe favoring dumbbell exercises after one or two barbell moves. Since I find them easier to warm up quickly and not so heavy as to necessitate long rests, I've also been assigning homework to supplement the limited workouts I can offer people. Thus, I might be able to have clients at a set. At sets over metal cycle, my fight trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Uh, I think assigning the homework, if, you're, if your bosses say it's okay, I think it's fine. I think trying to reduce rest times unless the rests are too long, reducing rest times can backfire by causing less hypertrophy because they're not as recovered. So I'd be very careful about doing that. If you have clients standing around after a minute and being like, I'm ready to go, and you still rest three minutes, yeah, going to two is probably going to be awesome and be able to do more work and get great. But if at two minutes they're like, and you're like, all right, it's time to go. They're like, oh, can I rest another minute? You're like, nope, time to go. Then you might be not getting as much effort. Yeah, I, I agree. And we understand like you're, you're, you have some constrictions that are job related. So I would say the homework might be a better option because now you're kind of flirting with altering the structure of your program, which seems to be a little bit more rigid based on your job. So you might get, you know, potentially in trouble. I, I would say if it allows for it, you could consider using supersets like that's Mike usually recommends in kind of personal training settings. It sounds like that's probably not on the table, but if it is, that would be a good way of getting more stuff per unit of time. Um, I think the homework's the way to go. Yeah. Besides your upgrade on hypertrophy, where can I read about maximizing hypertrophic effect of straight sets or maximizing the hypertrophic effect of short workouts? Uh, James Krieger probably is the place to go for that. Um, and, that. Just keep in mind too, like 
I'm not trying to, 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 ba- to bash your question here, but this is like an oddly specific thing. Like, where can I read about that? It's like, <laughs> you're going to have to piecemeal together a lot of indirect yeah. things. There's not going to be like a book or an article that says how to maximize the hypertrophic effect, hypertrophic effect of straight sets. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like put you, your question down, but just keep in mind, that's not like a, a searchable type term. You're going to have to look at a variety of things and kind of make your best decisions based on like a conglomerate of information. Yeah, and in addition to that, um, the upcoming hypertrophy book does have a distinct section with literal recommendations uh, of how to do that. So that will be in there, but short of the hypertrophy book, unfortunately. Not. He says, uh, also, while I have your attention for the four-day male physique template with legs focus, should high rep hams and high rep quads in meso one stick to the 10 to 20 rep range for all other exercises, I'm doing six to 10 reps. I didn't know we had a high rep as well. I think you just type in the percent, Matt, or you type in the, the load that you're using for 10 RM and then the loads are determined after that. So whatever. Yeah, the, does. the calculation does kind of put the put reps in, into different kind of general rep ranges, but you don't have to worry about that real explicitly on the MPT. It's done for you. Yeah. Okay, doke. Who's next? Brandon Armstrong. My past few questions have been long and plenty, so here's a short one. What are you guys' thoughts on training calf for hypertrophy and for strength for performance purposes like running and jumping? Is either worth the gains that may be attributed to those areas? For hypertrophy, definitely. Um, oh, I think he means uh, training calves for hypertrophy and for strength for performance purposes, like making right, bigger right. and stronger. Um, I, I think, uh, James, uh, you're the expert here. My hypothesis is minimal. Um, yeah, there, 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 is, there is some case to... Um, some calf training stuff for like minimizing ground contact time and keeping like the elasticity and rigidity of the foot on contacts so that as you are like doing something like a sprint, you don't like mush when you step, you're able to like really spring off of each step really uh, hard. Um, but I think that more comes from the actual sprint training itself rather than the uh, hypertrophy training that you do to try and make your calves bigger. I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know if there's any merit in jumping at all. There might be. I think that's going to be overshadowed by the hips and leg strength. Um, sprinting, maybe? Yeah. Sprinting, you, uh, so there was a problem with sprinting. Shank mass is correlated negatively to running performance. Yeah. Um, I think Your if you calves, have like, – got to drag them around. Yeah, I think if you have weak calves, like if you if you if when you like do any type of running movement, if you really like pancake your foot down in every step because you can't control it, yeah, there's a case there, but most athletes don't find themselves in that position. Like if you run around enough in your sport, you probably get enough calf training to not have that problem. So I, I, don't, I don't see a huge case that could be made. I could see a case, but it's not a very strong one. Dr. Mike just ripped a big fart. I saw the way you leaned over. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just, I saw you like, you muted the mic and leaned over. So it looked like you were trying to rip a big fart. No, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. Can you hear any other noises? Yes, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll just carry Fun. on. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever. I switched yeah. away from the super pickup. Mic. Um, all right. Fictional Funkness asks, I'm sure this has been covered, but I couldn't find it. How long does a maintenance period need to be to ensure that delayed hypertrophy takes full effect? Um, I wouldn't call it delayed hypertrophy. I would call it resensitization, but I think the consensus is like somewhere in the three to four week range. If you start to make arguments for a maintenance period of less than two weeks, it's probably downhill. Two to three, we have time for, but there are some other things that psychologically wise, diet break wise, uh, it's uh, joint recovery wise, that you may be able to benefit from slightly longer. Um, you know, I, th- I know the phrasing wasn't super, super great on that, but what he, I think what he might be talking about is like, um, like for your set point to rise up to your new heavier weight, that might be kind of what he's leaning towards, unless I'm mm-hmm. reading too deeply into it. What do you think about that? Yeah, I wonder. I still think about three or four weeks. Yeah, I think that the end result's the same, but I think, I think uh, maybe instead of delayed hypertrophy, like, um, you know, like post-mass settling point, I think is what we're getting at, and it's probably around the same. Doug Schmore. What a great name. Hi, Docs. Can a meso that focuses on, say, arms and calves and puts all the other large muscle groups down to the low ranges of their MEVs run longer than the typical meso length, thus due to, this due to less systemic fatigue? If so, what would be the approximate length? B, there would absolutely be no way to count the approximate length of that. 
The important thing is that the local MRVs don't need to be hit or hit at least once on deloaded. Uh, so it really just depends on how you progress locally. And a lot of times if a, a muscle fiber is, or is a muscle is more fast twitch, then it actually just can't progress for as long as a muscle that's slower twitch and recovers faster. But um, I don't think there's a reliable thing we can tell you on that. That's exactly what auto regulation is for. Yeah, I agree. Um, the thing is, like, you don't really want your mesocycles to be limited by systemic fatigue. You want them to be lo uh, limited by the local fatigue for the muscles that you're emphasizing. And so that's a good problem to have. So you at that point, you just go based on peripheral uh, MRV rather than systemic. And that's, that's the yeah. ideal situation. So that's good. Yeah, but that'll still limit you. Um, and we're not sure how much depending on like your arm genetics or whatever. Yeah. And like, you know, like you might overreach on your calves and that might, it might take like two or three days to get kind of back to normal versus right. like other muscle groups might take eight days, nine days, you know, so it's, right. it's hard, but just do your best. Yeah. Mark Conway says, hi, Mike and James, UK super fan again, more specifically, I'm from Newcastle in England. So I'm afraid we don't say oi much here, James, our usual way of greeting each other <laughs> is to say, Arit. Arit. <laughs> Arit. Uh, or e, as in all right. So it's actually more of a question than a greeting. I hope this information enhances both of your lives. Or yes, not already very has. much so. Thank you. First of all, thanks for uh, a lot for answering last week's question. I'm finding my hamstring seems to be handling five day MPT even better than the four day PL templates. We're happy about that. Excellent. Sweet. When five day template is going great and I'm loving the extra volume. However, when it came to Saturday workout, I find my shoulder was clicking during condom press. So it's just a ban on those sets. My shoulder was fine performing this exercise early in the week. The clicking isn't exactly painful. It just causes discomfort and is off-putting. Today, I found I had the same clicking during the incline dumbbell during my warm-up sets. I adjusted the angle of the bench from 45 to 30. found the clicking went away once I warmed up. My question are, questions are, what could be causing the clicking? Usually, it's just uh, joint structures rubbing up against each other, like tendons and ligaments yeah. and stuff like that. A lot of the time, too, it's just like a tendon going over a hard, bony protrusion and yep. just snapping down. Like, psh, psh, psh. Yep. Uh, is it a sign something is wrong? Absolutely not. Uh, yes unless it comes with pain that is increasing in magnitude with every rep or every set and every week. And if it's not, then you're totally fine. Do you have any advice on how I can go about preventing it? You may not have to prevent it uh, at all, but just picking an angle like you did or picking a different grip width or something is usually a really good solution. Bone surgery. And that's right. You need to redesign your body. <laughs> go to South Korea, have them take you apart. If it is due to muscle tightness, it's not. No. Would you recommend implementing any foam rolling? No, because it's no. So anyway, so all the best. Thank you both in advance, Mark. Yeah, just like if it creeps you out, just pick another grip width or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, try to do it for a while, and it probably will just lead to nothing, and then the clicking just won't bother you anymore. Or sometimes you just click for a while, and then it goes away. Yeah, it's nothing, nothing to be overly alarmed about. Yeah. All right. Uh, Michel Karam says, Hello, Dr. Mike and Dr. James. How are you? We are well. Doing good. Thanks, buddy. My current mesocycle is nine weeks. Week one, 12 sets MEV. And then week nine is so, so there's a, sets. There's a progression in volume, but there's a mystery progression in R. Uh, mystery, four, three, three, progression, progression, progression. Okay. My question is, how should I progress in RAR for best results? While I'm adding one set each week, as you can see, the number of sets is for muscle group per week. Uh, Michelle, do not add a set per week. Uh, use the RP set progression algorithm. It's on our hypertrophy guide in the volume landmarks um, article. Do that instead. Starting at 12 is fine. And then do that and let your sets naturally expand into what they're supposed to be. Don't proactively order them because you may get into a situation where you're adding sets not quickly enough, too quickly. Anything in between. As far as RAR, I would say RAR should start at three or four like you did. And depending on how many weeks you're doing, it should just gradually descend to zero or one. So if you did an eight week meso, it would be like four RR, four RR, three RR, three RR, two, two, and then one, one, something like that. Or three, three, two, two, one, one, zero, zero, something like that, right? If you did a four week meso, it would just be one week for each and everything in between and everything. I will say nine weeks sounds like a clusterfuck and I wouldn't try it as a cycle that James and I on the last webinar and actually the past couple have said that the literature and theory supports pretty well that those cycles over over eight weeks of accumulation is really just a road to nowhere and you're going to get no better results doing more than that. 
As a matter of fact, you'll just be creeping along, training some maximum for too long and getting not so great results. So. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like deliberately adding only one set for the purposes of expanding your mesocycle out to be that long is probably not worth your time. In fact, you, you, I would argue that you could have two mesocycles from MEV to MRV in that same amount of time. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's yes, like, what 100%. are you doing? <laughs> All right, another question. Beside my bodybuilding, I also train street workout. You know what I'm saying? Talking shit like that. Oh, my goodness. In the street street um, workout. And I do a lot of hard exercises like front levers, muscle ups, et cetera. Cool. This is a style of training that we use in street workouts and we want to build muscle and not working on skills and tricks. High set circuits, high rep workouts, for example, 10 circuits of 20 pull-ups, 30 weighted dips, 50 weighted push-ups. Wait, you do 10 of each of those? 10 circuits. Uh, oh, wow. So that that's times 10. Charted. That's insane. Um, that's officially stupid. We'll get to why. I now mean, if you, could, if you could do 10 by 30 weighted dips, like, holy fuck, man. You need to get your ass to the gym and do <laughs> dips with 180 pounds instead. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, my first I don't think I could do, I don't think I could do one set of 50 unweighted push-ups. But I mean, yeah. not, not to the beat, could, not for tit for tat. But I mean, I'm saying that's like a crazy feat. I probably <laughs> can't do 50 push-ups. I definitely, I can probably do 30 weighted dips if I start fresh, and that's the limit. I can't do 20 pull-ups, so I'm out of that workout altogether. I'm set number one. Um, and then he says, now my first question is, does progressing with circuits number is the same as progressing with number of sets? I mean, I'm going from MV to MRV, but in circuits, that's yeah, totally. So you might want to start with a circuit of one of these fucking things and auto-regulate how many of them you can actually get through before your performance drops. There's no fucking way you're going to be able to do 10 circuits of a shit up front and not decrease performance. No fucking way. I don't, I want to see someone <laughs> actually do this work. I don't like, believe that people are doing it. I'm a little skeptical myself. There is an important distinction here that he said somewhere that I'm trying to find. Here we go. Uh, in this style of training, we use in street workout, we want to build muscle and not working on skills and tricks. So that's an important distinction because if you were working on skills and tricks, you would not use a volume progression at all, at least for yeah. some of these things. You would mostly use uh, an intensity or as, as a proxy for specificity progression yeah. where you make them progressively harder and you develop yeah. higher levels of mastery as you go. But if you're just trying to develop basically the work capacity to execute those skills, then yes, you could use a volume progression, but it would certainly not start at 10 and i don't even know if it would end at 10 necessarily because that's Dude. If, if you can do three sets of 20 pull-ups um I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining anything that you can't do at that point <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> you need to fight crime bro yeah, right it's just what i'm saying like it's, it's so it's kind of like at some point there's probably diminishing returns where you're just doing a lot of i mean but seriously it's like if you can do three sets of 20 pull-ups like what pull what pulling movements can't you do same thing goes for like two two sets of 50 push-ups like what can't you do you can certainly break dance at that point right like there's nothing stopping oh my you God. uh i don't know so I'm, I'm just i'm just thinking like at some point I mean, 10 seems like 10, 10 of that is overkill to me. Um, and then my second question is, does bodyweight exercises have high SFR versus gym exercises? No, um, not necessarily. These, these are, these are gym exercises. Okay. Pull-ups, weighted dips and weighted push-ups are things you do in the gym. They're just one of the many different kinds of exercises and the SFRs are individual. Pull-ups, weighted dips and weighted push-ups for most people have very good SFRs. But uh, there's, for some people, they're dog shit. Like some people, their dip, dips just destroy their elbows and their SFR sucks. And for them, a machine dip or a close grip bench would be way better. So um, generally speaking, I actually can, can make a general statement. James, let's see if you agree with this. On a, make sure I couch this appropriately. On a, a first level of examination, theoretical basis, gym exercises should have a higher SFR than exercises done anywhere else because the gym is specifically designed to enhance the SFR of lifting. Like that's why it exists. Because you can control the load, first of all, which with body weight you can't control. Yep. And then second, load. you can actually use specific movement patterns, which body weight yep. is very limited. So yeah. Imagine like stone loading versus barbell rowing. Like stone loading has mostly axial and systemic fatigue. <laughs> And barbell was mostly local, you know, like that's, yeah. so I would say the gym is the best place to work out. I also would say that 
if James and I were training a, a street workout guy, like a parkour person who did free running, um, I was, see, I was thinking more like, like Santa Monica street performer guy, you know, like where they sure. do like flips even, over yeah, people yeah, yeah. and stuff. <laughs> so even, even that, I would train those people in, in I would, uh, James and I would probably do this. We would probably, for their hypertrophy and strength work, get them into a gym for their exceptionally high risk and high output technical work, send them to a gymnastics studio to be mm -hmm. trained by gymnastics coaches. And then for their very specific street workout tactical application, we would work out in the street on the implements in which we were performing. And the, the, the blocks of training would be structured such as the following. Uh, gym work would predominate in the first third of the block and slowly descend. Gymnastics work would predominate in the second block, being a little less in the first and less in the, in the last. And then street workout specific, specific training would uh, rise throughout the time and predominate in the last block, upon which you would have a big street workout performance doing things that you've never done before. Um, that's how I would do it. James, any disagreement with that? No, no. And like some, some of the stuff like in the first meso, it might just be like working on choreographing some basic sequences, right? It might yep. not even be actually doing a whole floor routine yet. It might just yep. be like, oh, this looks cool like this. You know, Mezzo 2 might be um, like, okay, now we're working on some of the sequences that we had choreographed and we're doing it in the in gymnastics isolation. room in like mm -hmm. the studio. So it's mm -hmm. safe. So now we're kind of practicing, seeing how this looks. And then in the third one, maybe you're actually doing it out in the street like you're going to be performing it in public, you know? Yeah. So there's definitely like a skill and tactical progression in intensity that you can use that would be yeah. great. And remember most street street performers won't be training like this because they're not sports scientists. They're just people that are good at their craft. If you had an Olympics of street performing within two years, the Chinese would have redeveloped the model James and I just talked about, and they would win every single Olympics in street performing. And people would wonder why is it different than back when we used to have fun? You know, <laughs> like um, it's so funny too. Cause like the best country in the world for breakdancing is South Korea by a long shot. What do they do? They just systematize the fuck out of it. Like, they train. They literally meet up to train. They're not just like people having fun. They have a team and a schedule. And it's like, man, they took all the fun out of breakdancing. Well, you want to win? Like, you will train. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you That's want to be I the mean. best at something, it's often not fun. So, yeah. It's like people used to train for boxing. I mean, you used to train for boxing just by throwing some gloves on and fucking around with the guys. And then you were the world champ. Nowadays, you have training camp, you know, and you have 10 coaches and a nutritionist and all this is what it takes, right? So, I'm saying this because a lot of people say like, yeah, but none of the higher level street performers do what you're saying. It's yeah. When they do it, they'll be better. Yeah. It's just not and, it, and again, it's like, it, it is a bit of a thought of experiment where it's like, we're just throwing ideas out of like what could be done. It doesn't mean that people are actually doing it, but we, I would, if I were a betting man, I would say that you take somebody who's already a super high performer yeah. and put them through like a scientific process of doing it. They'll be even better. Right. And that's the yeah. idea. 100%. Uh, thanks a lot, doctors. You're absolutely welcome, Michelle Karam. Thank you for the questions. All right, Khalid B. I work hard for my results and I need my diet dialed in. The RP Diet app tells me what to eat to keep me on track and offers suggestions for changes based on my responses giving me the freedom to choose my path. A personal digital diet coach for less than $15 a month? Yeah, that works. Uh, hello, Dr. Mike and James. As a background, I'm new to RP. I'm really loving the physique template and I'm enjoying learning about all sorts of hypertrophy-related stuff from you guys. Awesome. What drove me to RP is an observation on my part. Ever since I started periodizing my training by increasing volume and then deloading, I started to see great results. Awesome. Then I saw some of Dr. Mike's content on YouTube and I knew that applying his concepts would be the best way to optimize my training. My question is the following. I'm currently in day one, week four of a five-day male physique 2.0 template. I, we have to know which one it is because there's three of them. But we'll get to that. Um, actually, there's four. Sorry. There's full body, arms and shoulders, chest and back, and lower body. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of my performance in the last two sessions. Wondering if I have already hit my MAV and what to do about that. Here are the details. I started week one at about 10 cents per muscle group, and I have been rating everything consistently as one, okay? I hope you were rating it as one because you really didn't feel the workouts a lot and recovered not, very fast. Yeah, not arbitrarily doing a friend, it. A friend of mine is doing the male physique templates right now, and he's like, I'm doing like six and seven sets of everything. And I'm like, he's like, I'm sore all the time. He's like, what are you rating at? I was like, 
She's like, zero or one? I'm like, start rating it a zero for the love of God. Why one? Oh, oh my goodness. Sorry. I don't mean to sidetrack. I picked up a new client and this person will remain anonymous, but they were doing one of the templates and they sent me the last mesocycle and it was like eight sets, 10 sets per mm-hmm. exercise. And I, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I just was like, I'm doing the training and I sent a very friendly reminder, just like, you know, when I see stuff like this, it seems a little off. So I would, I would encourage you to revisit your technique. Let's use some pauses, some controlled eccentrics and some I don't, you know, just gave the normal kind of rundown, mind muscle connection. And the person got back to me like, you know what? I thought that seemed a little weird because I was doing like 10 cents per muscle group at some point. I was like, yeah, man, it's super weird. Should not be that. I just, uh, I was on a podcast just before this, um, Luis Freelingsdorf. Fri- Fri- um, it was like, it must be from Germany or Austria or something. But um, I actually referred to you on the, the high volume stuff. He was talking about that raising set volume maybe isn't a good idea if you haven't really focused on the quality of the exercise. And mm. I was wholly in agreement and I yeah, yeah. elaborated on it. And I told him about the, what I learned from you is the James Hoffman skeptical eyebrow. Like when my colleague James sees like you're doing 40 sets per week, he doesn't immediately go, man, you have a crazy high MRV. He's like, let me see you do a bent row. And you <laughs> send it to him and you're like, that's not a bent row. And I'm like, oh, okay. And that's eight reps shy of failure, not two. And they're like, oh, and then they do right. You know, like, You've seen like when I train people like with leg, like leg press or hack squat and then full mm-hmm. squats for the first time ever, they're like, uh, uh, I can't feel my quads. But, uh, three yeah. sets. So, yeah. Start going up and you're like, well, how many sets of quads do you do? Like 15? Like mm, you can call those sets, but they're not. So. Yeah. And a lot of that's just like learning too. Cause like sometimes people aren't familiar with reps in reserve, you know, sometimes they're just like not necessarily been coached on technique very sure. much, you know, so it's an easy mistake to make. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, now I'm so I started 10 sets from muscle group and I've been rating everything since there's one now about 20 sets from muscle group for arms. I added more sets on top of the template as I'm used to higher volume for them. Okay, typically do 15 to 20 sets bicep and tricep per week. I started my arm volume at 10 sets per week bicep and 10 per week tricep from three from RP uh, plus the seven I oh, added. Okay, so wait, sorry, was he saying in week one he was doing 10 sets per muscle group per week or per per yeah per week? Okay, okay, which is really close to how we program. But. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm at 15 per bicep and 15 per tricep uh, using uh, my sets using the RP auto regulation are now five and I have added one more set per week uh, per arms that I added. Okay, cool. My progress has been great. At weeks one to three, I was adding more sets as well as more reps on all exercises. Interesting. However, on day five of week three and day one of week four, I struggled to finish the sets. I had to do 35 sets in day five of week three compared to 28 uh, in day five, week two, my performance in the beginning of the workouts was great. That means you did not hit your MRV, by the way. Um, I matched did better than my last week, despite uh, the added sets. Also, I was not sore at all in any muscle group at the beginning of the workout. That's another very good confirmatory sign. Sounds like you just got tired at the end of that workout. <laughs> yes. So, however, by the time I got to my last two exercises, lap pull, I mean, climb bench, I was Oh, there it tired. is. <laughs> I still matched my performance. And then he goes into the details. Uh, okay. That's, that's absolutely totally fine. Um, for the last exercise, okay, so he says, still match my performance. Um, I was not sore and my performance was great at the beginning, but perhaps slightly uh, suffered as I got tired towards the end due to the amount of volume, perhaps due to the extra arm sets I added to my program. Uh, definitely helps. Mm-hmm. I've also struggled today. My performance is not at all good. And we three did 12 sets of chest, incline 13, blah, 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 flat, blah, blah, blah. Today, incline 13, 12. 10, 9, 7. So if we used a pure mathematical approach, you actually did not reduce your performance. Uh, so you're fine, actually. It's just you're getting tired. All the same weights as last week. I have, um, have I reached MAV? So MAV is not detectable landmark with uh, performance. It's just MRV. So the, the term there is MRV. Should I deload or is a slight drop in performance, i.e. my flat bench performance expected, so I'm doing more volume. So the way we calculate performance drops, um, and uh, James and I are, worked considerably on this for an unrelated project that we'll talk about some other time. Uh, James knows what I'm talking about, but mm-hmm. the right way to calculate her muscle group MRV is using the first um, exercise because the second exercise is poisoned by the fatigue of the first and the fatigue of others and so on. It doesn't even matter. So like if your chest is overreached, you'll suck on the first exercise, yes. get out the second one. Yes. What you're experiencing is you are getting into your per session MRV you're exceeding your within an intra-session MRV that is the first sets uh, affect the ability to do the uh, later sets. Um, and that happens when you do these crazy high volumes that you're doing because you're plus one everything. 
you basically reach a situation in which maybe your systemic MRV and your per muscle group MRV is so high on a weekly basis that you have such great recovery that you're actually exceeding your work capacity within a particular session, which can happen. Your recovery ability is here, your work capacity is here. Um, this tends to happen with fat power lifters uh, in an unrelated <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, you've seen it before where they're like, I recover great. How many sets can you do of squats? Like 10, 3, 1, and then I throw up. <laughs> <laughs> So five, three, one, that's just, you do five reps. Three reps, one reps <laughs> up. That's what I thought it was. Right. So, um, uh, you're not in that camp cause your work capacity is great, but it's not as great as your recovery ability clearly. Cause most people would have hit MRV by now doing that many sets. Um, the thing is you're in a bit of a conundrum. Um, I would train each set harder next time you do the mesocycle, get closer to failure, really focus on your technique to blast the muscle and don't press the plus one as much press the zero more. Uh, plus one every now and again, but mostly press zero on the auto regulator to keep the sets constrained so you don't run into this problem. So that keeps your workouts more high quality and less fluffy. Um, and secondly, I would start to suggest that you look into a six day a week session, or even if you have the time, split your work. Um, because you might be in a situation where your total ability to do work is just not something you could cram in to six days, which brings back to this is not at all what you're asking, but it's just a hilarious uh, related comment. I remember someone was uh, very upset at RP for not making a two-day male physique template that covered the entire body. And it was like, oh, sorry, it was, no, no, it it wasn't. No, it wasn't a special. Why why isn't there uh, an advanced two-day and three-day male physique template? And I was like, yes, I remember that. The advanced cannot progress on three days of training unless you want to train for five hours at a time. And, and if, it's like, a, if it's a two-day yeah. program, it's going to look like the beginner program anyway because it's just yeah, like, like, you know, advanced, you, you more advanced, exercises. Like, yeah, yeah. Right, Luke, you know, James, all those IFB pros that train twice a week, you know, like, yeah. what the fuck are you talking about? So you're just running into that situation. It's totally fine, but there's, you know, train a little bit harder, less volume per session. Uh, that would be the second best solution. The first best solution would be to increase the number of sessions and split up your volume. Yeah, so that was a really good good feedback from Dr. Mike. Uh, so I know I know you didn't. Nec- I think we have concluded that you didn't mean to say MAV. You were probably meant to say MRV. But in a technical sense, you were actually correct. You probably were training at MAV for a long period of time. You actually haven't hit your MRV yet. Mm-hmm. So you got good news. You are in a bit of a conundrum, as Mike said. But the more that you kind of find these things, and the longer you stick with it, your work capacity will actually start building up over the next couple of mesocycles. So your recovery ability might be up here, and your work capacity is here now. But but each mesocycle you go, it kind of goes up a little bit more over yeah. time and you'll be able to tolerate more and more and more. So if I think you, if you do the things that Dr. Mike described, I think you'll be in good shape and just do your best for now. Like if you, if you really start to notice, like even if you have a little bit more gas in the tank for the muscles that you're training, but by the end of the session, you're just wiped out, just treat that as a zero. Like if you already are noticing on like week three or week four that you're like by the end of the tail end of the workout, you're just out of steam. Like don't plus one. And even if you think you could have done more bench or more squats in the beginning, at some point, like there's a reasonable cutoff point where um, the systemic is becoming limiting and trying to cram more and just isn't going to yeah. be able to do it. Instead of plus oneing it, just go closer to failure than you normally would have. Add more reps than you normally would have. Um, basically like just know that plus one will add volume. Look at your current workouts that you're doing this week and think, can I really do more volume than this without a performance drop and a degradation in quality in the last sets? Like, yes, then add volume. Fine. If you are recovering, even if you're recovering, you're like, there's no way I'm going to do more volume. Just don't hit the plus one, hit zero, and then try to get a little slightly higher, better PRs on the next week. Yeah. And you'll be at MAV for a very long. So keep in mind, MAV is like a big, like big section under our kind of, curve of volume landmark so no, no harm there even if you don't actually truly hit mrv just leaving like a very marginal f- fractions of percentage points on the table at that point so you're still doing fine yeah e m a h r v e e oh is that like ham rv ham rv <laughs> um all right one of my, just a quick aside, one of my most annoying things I've ever heard is, remember this, this used to be a meme that people said all the time back in like 2010, 2009, that, that dare internet or the, uh, uh, the, the internets, like the spelled wrong, T-E-H. the internets with a Z. The thing is, is that there is 
nobody who's ever said that. So you're mocking someone that it's like mixing a 1930s hillbilly with the year 2009. Like, shut up. You're not clever. You have no actual real life friends. Fuck you. God damn. Tell us what you really feel. Like. Yeah. Some of the internet's the internet lingo definitely goes over my head. Maybe that's because uh, like inside jokes of inside jokes of memes. Or it's like it's the, like, I'm like the okay boomer version of a millennial where you're like, okay, yeah. you're like the old, old gen millennial. Like you're the yeah. fucking old guy already. I'm like, all right. I don't even know what, what does okay boomer mean? It means okay. Like, boomers. Like when you, when there's like, you know, somebody like our parents age and they're just not getting something that you're talking, you're like, I don't understand why we don't have free college. And they're like, uh, because that means it lowers the value of college for everybody. And they're like, okay, boomer, like you don't get what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like you're too old to understand. You're too out of date. So okay, boomer is something you use when you can't actually explain yourself because you're fucking wrong and stupid. Or, or you think that the person is like irreparably out of tune. With right. I got it. Cause you again, can't explain yourself. Yeah. Yes. So that was like definitely like a, a recent one that I think is really funny because it's also kind of true because you know what I mean? Like, like, like it's hard to get like uh, that generation to like not be racist, for example, you know, like they'll make or like, like understand comment. that Facebook videos of Trump are not to be sent to anyone and not to be shared. Right. And you're just trying to dumb. say like, look, times have changed. You can't say like, you can't call things gay when you mean that they're stupid. Yeah, you can't for like, sure. just casually like be racist, right? That's just not acceptable. Right. And they, they, they look at you like, what? And, you know, that's where it's like, okay, boomer. Like, I'm just, you're, you can't be helped. You know what I sure. mean? Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's fun. It is because everybody's experienced that. Like your grandpa or your dad or so, says something. Yeah. And you're like, dude, you can't say that. I, I have much more trouble explaining to people why certain things that actually make other people feel bad are not a good idea. But I do struggle with people who are like, like my dad emails me spam like <laughs> yeah. here's an article about the election from a russian website and i'm like dad are you fucking out of your mind no way i'm opening that he's like why not i'm like don't open that and he's like <laughs> really i'm like this is how you're gonna get fished are you out of your fucking mind yeah now you're getting targeted ads for whatever bullshit that and is. you know he's like really why and i'm like okay that's actually quite a nuanced explanation for like what's okay to share and what's not yeah, so I do like All that right. one. That one makes me chuckle. Yeah. Theano P says, Dear Mike and James, apologies in advance if you've covered similar questions already. Question one, how can you break the plateau when it comes to max weight you can use for a given movement? Been stuck at 10 Get kilograms. Get stronger. Damn. <laughs> that's it. All right, and that's, that's the webinar. How can you break the plateau when it comes to max weight you can use for a given movement? Been stuck at 10 kilograms for 12 reps at the Arnold Press. Four sets and can't seem to go heavier than that without failing after five or six reps. Can I just say that I, I hate the Arnold Press as a movement? Is that the rotating dumbbell thing? Yeah. Yeah, the just rotation is highly um, pointless. Yeah, so I mean, it depends on what you're training for. If you're training for strength, then there's definitely like a series of strength related like face potentiation moves you could use across a block of training to help you get there. If you're training for hypertrophy, um, the bigger question is like, do you necessarily need to be getting big PRs on some of those movements? I would say like Arnold presses or shoulder presses, like uh, it's a good idea to be hitting PRs periodically, but it's definitely not a deal breaker. I would say maybe switch the movement. It might be a good time for some variation. Switch to just like a standard shoulder press or a barbell uh, seated shoulder press, get some variation in there. And then the next time you come back to it, you might be surprised to find that you're stronger than you were before. Yeah, that's my recommendation. Uh, deload, uh, spend a mesocycle not training overhead pressing very hard, spend a couple of mesocycles using another exercise for overhead pressing, gain some weight, and then uh, come back to the Arnold Press and do two or three mesos of progressively heavier weight, and um, then you'll deload uh, for all, when you need to in, within those mesos, and then after that, you're uh, going to be well on your way. Yeah. So remember, for hypertrophy training, the goal is not necessarily to get stronger. Stronger is just a happy accident of getting yeah. more muscle. So. <laughs> Question two, so you just, yeah, so you just train productively and then strength will come. Question two, related question, when it comes to isolation movements, for example, face pulls and lateral raises, if I go heavier than a certain weight, my shoulders hurt and I can tell that my form is not good. Uh, I have therefore maintained the same weight for several monthly cycles in order to maintain proper form. However, the monthly programs do not change in volume in terms of sets of reps. So my question is whether I need to up the volume since I can't seem to go heavier or whether I should do something else in order to break my strength plateau. Ah, there is, that is a problem. Thank you in advance for apologies for a long time. So um, really, really a huge recommendation here is to make sure you at least increase in repetitions. Adding sets is another thing altogether because it's just trying to get your like volume landmarks. 
for sure progressing reps. So basically what ends up happening is that your reps in reserve should fall from around three to around zero through each message cycle. And if you're using the same weight for the same reps, your reps in reserve probably rise for a while. And that's not good. Um, so like you start you have three reps on the tank, second week, you should not have four reps on the tank. You might have three again, but you should probably have like two. And then the next week, it's okay to have two. It's okay to have one, but it's not okay to have three again, probably. And it's probably not, for sure not okay to have four. So as you're lifting, as you gain strength and ability, you should de decrease the RIR to continually challenge. And the way you do that, if you don't change the weight, um, is to in increase repetitions. Uh, that's the key. And if it's tough to increase reps, sometimes you can increase sets. That's probably not going to be a cause of a lot of progress. Uh, it's going to be a very delayed progression. But uh, certainly, you should also be uh, increasing sets as well. Yeah, and, and again, not to be pedantic, but like... Um, it really depends on are you, and this is something that gets confused a lot. That's why we have to bring this up. It's like, are you training to be stronger and hit bigger uh, numbers or are you training to be jacked and more muscular, right? So like if you cannot progress in weight because the weight is limiting to pain and the technique of the exercise, then it's time for a new exercise and that you need to be doing something where you can increase the weight if you want to be stronger. If you just want to train to be more jacked and hope to see the numbers go up over time as a, as a result of that, then what Dr. Mike said is like the, the spot on recommendation. So yeah. kudos though for recognizing that pain and technique were in a not good place and not trying to push through it. So that's definitely the first move. Uh, I would say um, if you're, if the exercise is really limiting and it might just be time for a different exercise. If you if you it's like, if you, if you're having a hard time progressing on stuff because your technique is falling apart and it's causing you pain, pretty good for case sure. for a new exercise. Not for I, sure. Yeah. Okie doke. Time for YouTube. 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 Boom. Good. We're good. Huffman Tree says, should this be viewable to the public? Yes. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll exclude that one. Yeah. Pico Rodriguez says, Dr. Tony Huge. I know who that is. Um, not a doctor, by the way, but a real small guy. Is he huge? Uh, no, but he's <laughs> jacked. Uh, he's like an anabolic expert who lives in like the Philippines and everything's legal there. So he talks about it all the time. Hmm. Dr. Tony Huge says arachidonic acid is the best kept secret in bodybuilding is it increases inflammation in the muscles. He also sells a supplement, so it's probably biased. That's not necessarily the case. You don't have to sell things to be biased, and selling things does not mean you're biased. What is your opinion? Um, I've looked at the literature of arachidonic acid, and I've used arachidonic acid extensively in my youth. Uh, it doesn't do a fucking thing as far as I'm concerned. It's total bullshit. Sorry. I have not used it, but my uh, understanding and looking it up was the same. Um, I'll just, I'll just answer this, uh, this question. <laughs> yes. Yes. George P says, Hey, just one question, Mike, are you natty or not? I've been following your channel for three years. and want to know if you have been on gear or off it. If Love you're it. Natty, amazing. Um, George P would he, would he not be amazing if he wasn't natty before you answer that? That's what I want to know. Just pedestrian. So first of all, I don't offer my physique to anyone. I offer my knowledge and knowledge is either true or not, regardless of my physique. Um, try it yourself, logic it out. Secondly, uh, if I answer that question in a certain way, it would uh, automatically be evidence of a federal crime. So, George, for the love of fucking God, it's not something you ask somebody. Um, but Emil Jorgensen actually answered it correctly. Just listen to almost any Revived uh, Revive Stronger episode and you will get your answer, a winky face. So there's your winky face answer, George. Make some sense out of that. Yeah, and just to be very clear, folks, like, that's not, a, it's just like one of those, it's, one of those questions you just don't ask, right? Because how can the person not potentially incriminate themselves if sure. they answer? In, like, I, in several countries, it's legal. Like in the United Kingdom, it's decriminalized. Uh, if I lived in the United, United Kingdom, boy, would I talk about a lot of different stuff, but I don't. So I can't. Yeah. It's like asking like, hey, are you racist? Like, how are you supposed to answer that? <laughs> Even if you are racist, you know what I mean? It's like, hmm. And being racist actually isn't illegal. You don't go to jail for that shit. You right. just go to scumbag hell or whatever when you die. Um, all right. Nichols says, do you need, this is a great question. Uh, do you need 48 to 72 hours of rest between training the same muscle to failure? Or is that a myth? It is a myth. It is mm -hmm. whole cloth almost just made up from a few really poorly misread studies. It depends on the volume of training and the amount of damage the muscle takes and its structural uh, and architectural elements and a bunch of other stuff. So for example, if you do one set to failure of bicep curls, 
can you productively train biceps in an overloading manner again? In 30 seconds, the answer is yes. <laughs> like also in a day, the answer is still yes. Also in two days, right? Um, if you do 10 sets of quads, hack squat and, 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 uh, and regular squat, you may not be recovered until 96 hours later. So, you know, you are recovered when two things happen. One of them is the most important, the one is secondarily important. The secondarily important one is you're no longer experiencing delayed onset muscle soreness and perceptive dysfunction of the muscle. Basically, your muscles feel normal again. And second, much more important is you can match or exceed your prior performance. That means you have recovered. And that occurs, really depends on the exercise, the muscle group. And the most thing it depends on is how much volume you did in a particular session. You do one set, you can train every day. You do 10 sets, you may only be able to train twice or three times a week. So um, you'll know when you're recovered based on experimentation for yourself. And it's not a very difficult thing to assess. And there's also kind of the messy topic of you could actually still potentially present an overload when you are under recovered in the sense of training like days back to back, not necessarily on a weekly scale. But if you were to say like, I did biceps on Monday and my biceps are still sore on Tuesday, can I still actually have an overloading session on Tuesday? Uh, yeah, it's feasible. It can't happen. So it's not, it's not a cut and dry thing where it's just like, okay, you need 48 hours of rest between. It's, it's very variable. All right, Huffman Tree is an actual question, which is actually very good. And this will be our last question for today. Yeah. When assessing performance for the set progression algorithm, uh, for set progress algorithm, for the set progression algorithm, I read that right the first time, how much should be placed on the first work set and how much on the other ones? I've had this interesting situation where I went something like 8775 the first week then 9655 five, in the second week, and so on and so forth. In other words, my first set performance improved with the target RIR, but my later set performance deteriorated. Or does this merely tell me that I suck at judging RIR? Well, so everyone sucks at judging RIR to some extent. And then there's also in just fluctuations in performance between workouts that you can't help. Um, I would say that the most uh, eloquent way to, so James and I, uh, again, have been putting a lot of intellectual stock into this problem and probably the best way or one of the better ways of doing this in a reliable fashion um, is to take an average over all comparable sets. So for example, eight, seven, uh, actually, you know what? I'll just pull up a fucking calculator and do this right now. That's how straightforward this is. So Google, can you guys see my uh, shit? Mm -hmm. Calculator. Okay, sweet. So let's do this. So let's see if this works. Eight, oh, no. num lock, eight. Oh, wait, what the fuck? Come on now. Plus seven, plus seven, plus five. Enter 27 divided by four equals 6.75 rep average at whatever weight, sweet. So 6.75, remember that number. And we will do this. And then we have, look at, remember it for us. We don't even have to remember the fucking number. And then we have nine. 2130. Uh, six, six plus five plus five. 6.25. So that is technically a reduction in average performance over the set, right? Um, now, what do we take away from this? If we're really going to push the question, I think, James, what do you, like, one, at least one set average, or so one rep average decline is what we'd call, like, you're underperforming. Anything within one, within one rep, this is 0.5 of a rep that you lost. I wouldn't call, I would call this stability. James? Yeah, I, this is one of those where I really couldn't say either, I would say carry on. Like it's one yes. of those, it's like, you, yes. it's Continue not definitively training. one way or the other. I was it's not, you, you haven't for sure hit your MRV and there's a good chance you didn't because it would be stupid to fucking deload. And then you like, we're like, oh, I should deload, but I'm not. And then you do the next week and you, your, your rep average on the first four sets goes up to seven. And you're like, well, clearly I was not overreach because in another week and I still, and I got stronger. So um, I would definitely, you know, so you don't, do you have to do the math like this? No, you could just sort of look at your stats. And you're like, eh, on average, I think that's like just about the same, right? It, 
Yeah, James and, and I have said this before. Sorry, real quick, James. Um, uh, MRV tends to be pretty clear. Like, you're not going to do an average of 6.75 and then an average of 6.25. It's going to be like 6.75 and it's going to be like 4. <laughs> like, it's usually a big drop off when you really hit the, hit the end. Yeah, and like, you're st- the other thing you can, you can use is like, okay, your reps never fell out of the, you know, 5 to 30 rep range. In fact, they never even fell out of the range that you were operating in, 5 to 10. So it's like, okay, you're still having productive training there. Um, usually you would see something like <laughs> the next week would be like eight, four, two, two, something like yeah. that. That would be indicative of like MRV where it's just like, you just, you had a one set and then the rest was just, you totally shit yourself. Um, yeah. And also because you're trying to match your reps week to week, the perception of effort on those reps that you don't make is like godlike. You're like, yes. dude, like I can't, one of the reasons that your reps fall so, so massively is because you knew you hit nine reps in, the, in that first set and then eight in that second one. You hit eight in the first one, and you're like, fuck, I got to hit eight. And you do hell and high water and get six. Yes. The reason your next set is three, you could, if you just did normal RIR, you could have hit five on your next one. The reason it's three is because you poured everything into your first reps because you literally didn't recover, and there's no way to have the performance not catch up to you. Like, you're done, and it's obvious. Yeah. So Mike and I have been in a, in a separate project have been trying to figure out like what is a reasonable threshold where you can definitively say that you are underperforming. And we really haven't come to a strong consensus. And the consensus that we came to was guess and check for now and see how it turns out. Um, so it's, it's one of those, like, it's not, it's not like a hard line thing, at least for now, we don't really know when you say that like, this is definitively your cutoff point. So yeah. for now I'd say guess and check, use your best judgment. And usually yeah. when you see like massive drops on those reps, that's the best yeah. indicator. And when you feel like shit, when you feel the bar weight feel on your back feels absolutely terrible. When your RIR is going through the roof to try and get anything remotely close to what you were doing the last week, those types of things are, are probably your best indices. Yeah. When, by the way, guys, when James says guess and check, what that means is you do your um, uh, one workout, then you do the next one. And let's say like, it's about the same performance within one rep. Um, but it's like down a little bit, or it's just down by one rep on average, let's say. If it's down by like two reps on average, like you might want to just call it there, especially based on how you feel. That's where the feeling comes in. It's like if you're buried alive and your reps are falling, you've hit MRV. Like, and like by two reps, it's very likely that you're falling outside of your goal rep range as well. Sure, sure. But then, um, you know, if it's within one rep or even within two, James, when he says guess and check, means just go to the next week of training, train again, and see if the fall continues. Right. If you rise back up to week one, so like week two was down, but week, one, week three is back up to week one, you're golden. You're golden. Um, if you could fall again, it's time to cut it off because you don't want to get in a situation where you're training multiple weeks on end and just a little bit losing performance each time. That is technically like you just have a really great recovery week to week, but you've hit your MRV, then now you're just floating in the shit You're in the, zone you're in the Mordor zone. Yep. Seriously, that is literally Mordor. Like, there's two zones you want to avoid on perfect unit training. One is between your maintenance volume and your minimum effective volume, in which you get like some fatigue, but almost no stimulus. And then the other zone is MAV average is here, MRV is here, and you're right here for like a really long time. Like <laughs> when you pass your MAV average and get to MRV, this should take like one to two weeks. If you manage to stay here for longer, then you're just you're, slowly you're getting weak. A combination of ungodly, tough, and stupid. <laughs> yeah. It's the best. By the way, James, check this out. What do you got? Oh, this episode. Oh, there it is. Okay, Boomer. You'll have to listen to it. Yeah. It's funny. I don't think you should say that to people, but I do think it's funny when it comes up. For sure. For sure. <laughs> well, that was a good one. We had a bunch of good questions on that one. Super good. Super good. Uh, guys, thank you as always for asking these awesome questions. And I wish right. all of you uh, warriors death. Oh yeah, that's good. Are you going? Is, is are you going to Miami this weekend, or is that this? Folks, weekend? come see me in Miami this week. I'm going to oh, be giving yeah. a talk at Wadapalooza, at 11 a.m. on Saturday about um, nutrition myths. I'm basically going to be tangentially insulting the fuck out of a bunch of people. Oh, so you're going to be there um, for that if you're in the Miami area? So yeah. Check that out. However, my wife just contracted the flu, so I might just be having the flu there, but. I will show up to speak, mark my fucking words, unless I'm hospitalized, I do my fucking job. Then I'll try to speak from the hospital. 
All right, well, we're going to wrap this one up, folks. Thanks again for sending in your good questions. We appreciate it very much. Make sure you subscribe to the RP uh, YouTube feed if you want to keep getting updates on all RP-related things, and we will see you next time. Peace.